Welcome to Unit 1, Chapter 1, Lesson 2. From here on out, I'm just going to refer to everything as 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, so on and so forth, just to make it a little bit easier on us. Alright, so we talked about starting off each lesson with our objectives. Today's objectives will be, I will be able to estimate whole numbers using rounding, and estimate whole numbers using compatible numbers. Now, in regards to our objective rubric, just in case we might have forgotten, you should have your post rating filled out at this time for anything from 1.1.1. Right, so these top four right here should be filled out in both the pre and post rating and 11.2 should only be filled out for your pre rating. Alright, so here we go. We're introducing our vocabulary page today. So what that means is you have to go first to your vocabulary. Some lessons will have vocabulary, some will not. I usually start with vocabulary. Sometimes we have to bounce back and forth between vocabulary and the lesson. But for today, we're going to start with the vocabulary and then move on. Again, it's very important that you understand what the words mean and how to use them, because if you don't know what the words mean and how to use them, then you're not going to be able to solve word problems or any actual problems that you would need to solve in real life. All right, so what happens is you have the word here. So in this case, it's the word sum. I try my best to keep them in order in the lesson and on your vocabulary sheet. Sometimes it doesn't end up that way, so if you need to, you can always pause the video, find the word, and then hit play. Okay, so for this one, we have the word sum. The definition for the word sum is the solution or answer to an addition problem. So what this means is now you are going to go to your vocabulary, and you will take your pencil, and you will fill in the missing words. So the solution or answer to an addition problem. Okay. Now in this case, I'm also going to show you the symbol and drawing for these because you have to understand what we're talking about. Now a lot of people say use sum interchangeably with add. Sum and add don't mean the same thing. But when you see the word sum, you know that it means that you are going to be using addition. Okay? But this symbol right here does not mean sum. This means add, plus, anything like that. But the sum, so you'll see here we have an example. So the example I'm going to give you is 4 plus 6 equals 10. The sum in this case is 10. So in your notes, what you should be doing is you should be writing down 4 plus 6 equals 10. And the reason that we circled the 10 is because that is actually what the sum is. This just helps you have a reference to what we're talking about. So the sum in this example is 10. Not the 4 plus 6, the 10. Okay. The next one, add-ins. Add-ins are any group of numbers or digits added together to form a sum. In this case, if we're using the example 4 plus 6 equals 10, the add-ins would be 6 and 4. Okay, so again, if we go back to our vocabulary, up here in the example box, I circled the 10 from that problem because 10 was the sum. However, in this case, I'm going to write down the same problem, just so we can keep it consistent, and I'm going to circle the 6 and the 4. Don't forget to fill in the vocabulary missing words here. 
Okay? So that when you go back and you look, if you're saying, oh, I don't understand what are add-ins, you have your own vocabulary page to go back and reference. You don't have to search through the glossary or go find a computer and find a uh, dictionary. You can just go into your workbook, look up the word, read the definition. Some of us, that helps us out more, and some of us like to use the example more, so we give you both options here. All right. Now, I'm not going to go back to that vocabulary page anymore, so if you do need some more help on it, or if you're confused, make sure to rewind and go back and check how to fill out the vocabulary sheet. If you're still confused, make sure to write yourself a note to ask me tomorrow in class. All right, the difference. The difference is the solution or answer to a subtraction problem. Right, so difference is much like the sum, except for now it's a subtraction problem that we're working with, not an addition problem. So in this case, if I were to do 10 minus 6 equals 4, 4 would be the difference. Again, the subtraction sign doesn't mean difference. It tells us that we need to subtract, but 4 is actually the difference. Again, if I'm moving too fast, you can always pause the video to finish filling out your examples or your definitions. The product. The product is the solution or answer to a multiplication problem. By now, I'm sure you're sensing a theme that we are talking about the solutions and answers to all the different kinds of mathematical operations. Right, so whenever you see a symbol that looks like this, an asterisk, sometimes we see X's, sometimes you will see a dot, sometimes you will see a number connected to a variable, which we will get into later. These all tell you that you are looking for the product. You're trying to find the product. Right? They don't mean a product, they just tell you that that is what you are looking for. And as long as we're talking about it, I will tell you that from here on out, the X is not able to be used in math class because we will start talking about variables and the X as a multiplication sign gets very confusing when you use an X as a variable. So we're going to start now practicing using either the asterisk or a dot. Okay, so those are the two things that you can choose from. Whichever one you choose is fine with me, but an X is not acceptable. So if I were to do 4 times 6 equals 24, the product in this case is 24. Again, circling the 24 to remind us of that. Quotient. I'm sure you've all guessed it. It is the solution or answer to a division problem. So whenever you see this symbol, the division sign, or if you see a slash like this, okay, those two symbols tell us that we are using division, that we are looking for the quotient. So for example, if I were to do 10 divided by 2 equals 5, 5 would be the quotient. Again, the symbol is not the quotient. The answer at the end is the quotient. All right. So now we're going to talk about rounding. Okay. Rounding, by definition, is to change a number to a more convenient or easy to use value. To change a number to a more convenient or easy to use value. So for example, instead of using 153, we can use 150. Now when we round, this tells us we're not going to get an exact answer. We're just finding an easier number to work with. To try and find what the answer is close to. Okay, so rounding makes us change this last digit and possibly even other digits to zeros because zero is the easiest number to add and subtract with. Compatible numbers, 
okay, are numbers that are easy to compute mentally. Okay, so numbers that work well together, like friends. Right? If a friendship is too complicated or you and this person do not get along, you are not compatible. Sometimes numbers don't work well together and don't get along, making them not compatible. So what we do is we can change some of the numbers to be compatible. Okay, so as an example, if I were to have, oh, let's say 40 divided by 6. Okay, these numbers are not compatible, so what I can do is I can keep the 40 and change the 6 to a 5 because 5 and 40 are compatible. And since 5 is close to 6, it's going to give us an idea that, okay, 40 divided by 6 is going to be somewhere around 8 because 40 divided by 5 is 8. This is a little bit complicated, however, we'll do some work with it and it'll start to make more sense as you use it more. All right, so we're going to estimate the sum by rounding to the thousands. So when you're rounding, what's actually happening is you're looking at the number that you have, which is 5,667, and you are taking that number, I apologize, you're taking that number and realizing that, okay, since it's 5,667, the smallest it could be is 5,000, okay, because that first number is a 5, so it can't be any smaller than that 5. So 5,000 is the smallest it could be. And the biggest it could be is 6,000. So it's somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000. So what we do is we think, okay, what's in the middle of 5,000 and 6,000? Well, halfway between those is going to be 5,500. Now, would this number be less than 5,500, so less than the middle, or would it be bigger than the middle? In this case, it's bigger than the middle, which tells us that when we round 5,667, it's going to round to 6,000. Okay, again, so 2,321, the smallest it could be is 2,000. The biggest it could be is 3,000 because it can only go up one spot on the thousand side. And again, right in the middle is going to be our 2,500. And we're determining is it less than that or more than that? Because it's less than that, we are going to round it to 2,000. Again, this is all only because we're rounding to the thousands place. So our estimated answer is 8,000. So when we add these two numbers for real, th the answer is going to come out to be close to 8,000. Will it be exactly 8,000? No. Each time we do this, though, we're not going to want to draw a number line and figure out what's in the middle, what's it closer to. So I like to use what I call the dot and box method. Right, so this is going to be one of the ways that you can show your work. And we talked about showing your work when we talked about the stations, so make sure that you have this on your separate sheet of paper. I promise you it's going to help you, and it's going to help you keep everything organized, and it's going to help your teachers help you because then we can see where the mistake is. Hey, if you don't show us this, we don't really have an idea of kind of what you're thinking or how you're working out the problem. All right, so in this case, I'm going to round to the tens place. So what I do is I take my pencil and I find the tens place, ones, tens. I place a dot under the number that's in the tens place. The reason I do that is to remind me of what number I'm working with. Everything that is to the right of that number goes into the box. Okay, so tens place goes into the box. 
the first number inside the box tells that dotted number what to do. So since this number is a 1, it tells the 3 to stay the same. I know some of us use the rule 5 or above round up, 4 or below rounds down. What that means is you don't change the 3 to a 2, it means that the 31 is actually going to change to a 30. That's how it's rounded down. So the 1 tells the 3 to stay the same. And now that it's decided to stay the same, everything inside the box changes to a 0. So 31 would round to 30. Okay. Now, the 7 tells the 5 what to do. Because 7 is bigger than 5. Okay, and remember, 5 is just our rule of thumb. Okay, I always decide 1 is less than 5, so it told this number to stay the same. 7 is more than 5, so it tells this number to go up. So the 5 will change to a 6. The 7 changes to a 0, because everything in the box changes to a 0. And now instead of having 57, we have 60. So now instead of doing 57 minus 31, we can do 60 minus 30 and have an idea of what our answer is going to be. So our estimated answer would be 30. Now you'll notice we always round, then add or subtract, multiply or divide. You always have to do that. If you round last, your answers will be incorrect. I will do one more example with you. We're going to stagger it though. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is what place value you, you are rounding to. And you're going to write that in your notes. So in this case, in this one you should have had tens. Okay, because that's where you rounded to. And then you should have the dot and box method shown. Now you don't have to draw the arrows, but if you want to, if that helps you, that's fine and then you should have the new numbers and then your answer in this case would have been 30. Anything that I write down on here and have a space for in your notes you have to have written down. Okay, This is how I help you to take notes instead of having you take notes completely by yourself I've set this up for you so if I put it on there I think it's important enough for you to have and to hold on to. Alright so in this case you are going to round to the tens place again. So what I would like you to do is I would like you to first pause the movie and do your dot and box. You don't have to round yet, just show me where would you put your dots and where would you put the boxes. Alright, so in this case we would have put the dot underneath the 1, the 4, and the 6 and the 8, the 2, and the 9 would have gone into the box. Now I want you to pause again and try and round the numbers. Determine does the 9 tell the 1 to go up or stay the same? Does the 2 tell the 4 to go up or stay the same? So on and so forth. And then write your rounded numbers in the boxes below. Alright, so the 9 told the 1 to go up, so this changed to a 20. The 2 told the 4 to stay the same, keeping this at 40. And the 8 told the 6 to round up, changing that to 70. So now instead of 19 plus 42 plus 68, because those are not easy numbers to work with, we are working with 20, 40, and 70. Okay? So 20 plus 40 is 60. 60 plus 70 is 130, so our estimated answer is 130. What I would like you to do now is I'd like you to please pause the video and complete numbers 3, 4, 5, and 6. For 3, you will round to the hundreds. 4, you will round to the hundreds. 5, you will round to the thousands and 6, you will round to the tens. You have a place to write that down in each of your problems and if you pause the video here you'll be able to see what you're rounding to as well. Alright, now that you're back you can take a look and check your answers.
if you got any of these incorrect, I would put a little mark next to them and make sure to ask uh, one of your teachers about them tomorrow. Otherwise, if you want to, you can always rewind and go back and check the lesson over again. All right, compatible numbers. When we use compatible numbers, remember, compatible numbers are numbers that work well together. In this case, 5 and 37 don't work well together. They'll work. We can find an answer. But if we're trying to do math quickly in our head, 5 and 37 are not going to make that easy on us. So in this case, I would change 37 to 40. 40 is not too far away from 37, and 40 is easy to multiply with because it ends in a 0. And when a number ends in 0, all you have to do when you multiply is take that first number, multiply it by this, the number that's listed. So we're going to take 4 times 5, which is 20. And because I have 1, 0, I have to add a 0 to my answer. So in this case, 4 times 5 was 20 and then I add that extra zero at the end. What I would like you to do is I would like you to first try changing, okay, finding compatible numbers for these next two problems. Then come back, we'll check and we'll talk about it and we'll move on. All right. So in this case we would do 3 times 15. The reason we're using 3 times 15, I know some of you probably changed it to 20, but the reason that we're doing 3 times 15 is because 15 is an increment that we work with on a daily basis. Okay? You might not think about it a lot, but when you look at a clock, clocks run in the 15 minute increments. If you think about it, we talk about it being quarter after 5, quarter to 6. Okay? Those are 15 minute increments. Right, so if we're doing 15 times 3, think about your clock. Okay, if I go 15 minutes, okay, that's one increment, so that's 1 times 15, which is 15. If I do two sets of 15, that gets me down to 30 minutes, okay, so 2 times 15 is 30. And if I do three increments of 15, that gets me to 45 minutes. So 3 times 15 is 45. Right. And 8 times 39. In this case, it was pretty self-explanatory for you. 8 times 39 wasn't going to work, so we changed the 39 to 40. And again, we can do that nice little trick where we take 8 times 4. Okay, 8 times 4 gives us 32. And then we have that 1, 0, so we add that 0 to the end, and we get 320. All right, you have this problem in your notes. What I would like you to do is I would like you to try each of these using compatible numbers. You only change one of the two numbers. You don't change both. You change one or the other. Okay, so I want you to try each of these, and when you come back, we'll check over your answers. All right, so in this one, it makes no sense to change the 100 because it's already a nice round number to work with. But we could change the 52 to a 50 because we know that 50 is half of 100, so 100 divided by 50 would give us 2. Okay, in this case, we change the 9 to a 10. Here we change the, s don't change the 60, we change the 23 and we change it to 20. And now in this one, it's a little bit different. Instead of changing the 8 to a 5, which I'm sure a lot of you did, you have to think of your multiplication tables. 64 is compatible with 8. So instead of changing this by 3, we only change this by 1. So we turn it into 64 divided by 8. And we know that that's going to give us 8. So the answer to this problem will be around 8. 
Again, it is a little confusing and you really need to know your multiplication tables. So make sure that you are practicing all of those and practicing with compatible numbers as much as you can. Right, where this comes into play is when we have situations like this. Mrs. Higgins is planning a party for the whole sixth grade. There are 17 students in each star and there are nine star classes. About how many students should she plan for? Okay, now instead of sitting here and saying, okay, well we'll do 9 times 17, that gives us an exact answer. But remember, we have to go through and pull out the important information. So in this case, is it important that she's throwing a party? Not for our problem. Is it important that there are 17 students in each star? Absolutely. And it's important to know how many star classes there are. It's also important to know the question. Okay, so about how many students should she plan for? Something really important inside of there, though, is the word about. Okay, about tells us that we need to estimate. We need to use rounding or compatible numbers. I don't want an exact answer when I ask about how many. All right, so in this case, I know that I would have to do 17 times 9 to get an exact answer. I don't like to do 17 times 9 in my head, and if you know Mrs. Higgins pretty well, you know that she doesn't like that either. Way more than I don't like it. So we're not going to change how many students there are in class, but we can change that 9 to a 10, because if you think about it, we'd probably want to have more than we need just in case we get a new student or if another teacher comes in that day, a parent. So sometimes overestimating is better than underestimating. And overestimating is where you change one of the numbers to a bigger number. Underestimating is where you change it to a smaller number. And if you underestimate, then we might not have enough for all of the students. Okay, so in this case, we'll do 17 times 10. Again, all you have to do is 17 times 1, which gives you 17. And because you have that 1, 0, you add 1, 0 to the end. Okay, so we should plan for 170 students. On Edmodo tonight, for your post, I want to know the following three things. What estimation technique would be best to use for division? What estimation technique would be best to use for addition and subtraction? And I want you to round 1,238,999 to the nearest hundred. Okay, this one can be a little tricky, so make sure to try your best. And remember that you can only have one number in each place value column. Right, so going over the techniques that we use, decide which ones are best for division and addition and subtraction, and round the number. Make sure to post your answers to Edmodo, and write down any questions that you might have to ask in class tomorrow.